as uh, Randy introduced me, I'm Stephen Watson, and um, I work now uh, more in the area of sociology of education. But I've got a background in maths edu education and in engineering. And um, the movement I've made in this is really, uh, over a long period of time, I think, thinking about uh, the relationship between humans and technology as an engineer, but then as a teacher, kind of thinking about the same sort of things. And um, then as I moved into higher education, I could start to think about these in more general terms, which is what we try to do, is produce knowledge. Now, uh, mathematics education as a social system um, is a very large project, and one in which I've no chance of um, getting over in this afternoon's session. So I'm going to focus on a particular aspect of that. We're going to do a bit of historical sociology uh, around mathematics and mathematics education. And if you go back to antiquity and classical antiquity, mathematics and mathematics education really become the same thing to a greater or lesser extent. But before I move on with the uh, presentation, I'll just think, tell you a little bit about how I'm thinking about laws of form. And uh, I asked a question uh, in response to a really brilliant presentation around the um, piece of software that um, uh, generates laws of form uh, particularly well. Uh, my view of laws of form, for a long time, uh, as I came to this, I would treat the mark as negation. So what's inside the mark and what's outside the mark are related, related by negation. And it's interesting going back to the predecessor of all the early work in terms of uh, Spencer Brown's work and the design with Noor, which has been a fantastic set of essays that have been recently produced. And to see, uh, when we see this as, as, as Noor, as the distinction, as a, a Noor gate, then uh, this generalises the mark and the distinction even further. Um, but I suppose I'd like to go in even further thinking in terms of uh, uh, the work of Nicholas Luhmann in that this, the distinction is a selection amongst uh, an almost infinite possibility. And that's why I was making the point about phenomenology and ontology. So in many ways I see laws of form as an algebra of ontology or an algebra of phenomenology in that every mark in itself is a selection. Now, I'm going to humanise that before we start the talk, or uh, I've started the talk before I uh, do a little bit of historical sociology and locate this in mass education, in that in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, we are going through the world creating meaning for ourselves in, in interaction with the world, in interaction with each other. And that meaning is always meaning within a surplus of meanings, as, Ricoeur, as Ricoeur, uh, Paul Ricoeur would say. Um, so this space beyond the mark um, is really difficult to articulate. It's in, it, you could say it's indeterminate, it's unknown, we don't know what it is, but even those don't quite cut it. Uh, we, we're making a distinction, we're making something concrete, if you like, we're making some meaning which always allows for further possibility. And that's the most general terms in which I think about laws of form. And that's useful for me, as it was useful for Nicholas Luhmann. So what I'm going to do here in about 15 minutes, so we've got a bit of a chance to tap, chat, uh, chat and go off a um, coffee. Uh, my starting point is really thinking about mathematics education, say now more generally about sociology and sociology of education, so much bigger issues, but because... Um, I'm so very grounded in mathematics education, having been a teacher in Grimsby, of course, um, where Spencer Brown was born, um, which I didn't know at the time. Um, so uh, there's a global preoccupation with the efficiency of mathematics education. And it's why I hang on to it, because I can always get money if I say I'm going to improve mathematics education. If I say I'm going to think about phenomenology, uh, people will <coughs> turn the door. Um, so there's a lot about research bowlers policy in, in curriculum, as decisions about mathematical content and pedagogy, uh, the professional learning of teachers, practice, teachers' classroom decision-making, etc. I've been involved in all of those things. Um, 
My starting point, or, or, or the point at which I've recently started, is uh, seeing this as constructive in society, and that leads into the, the next few slides. Now, in mathematics, there's a, a strong orientation, in mathematics education research, there's a strong or, or, orientation to the cognitive, which makes sense, and it makes sets this cognition social distinction, and part of the work I do is really looking at this distinction between the cognitive and the social. And that takes me more broadly into phenomenology and sociology. And of course, there's the dichotomy between research and scholarship and practice. Now, I could spend the evening talking about this. Um, and uh, just to, uh, I, I've, I've said most of this, so I'm going to move on. And, uh, you know, so I'm seeing the mark as this distinction, as a selection within the totality of indeterminacy. And I'll then say, those words are inadequate, and I've set it up a paradox immediately, because when I say this totality, which is contained, is not contained. But this is the phenomenological challenge. Um, and therefore, one way of looking at the laws of form, as its prime distinction, is its consciousness itself. And that's a useful way of looking at it. There, there are also limits to that, but one way of seeing this is uh, this um, uh, as a selection, distinction, mark space in the totality of dis determinacy, and as a distinction, the distinction between self and other, and the prompt for communication interpretation from that. What, why, the, why this is so revolutionary, and um, in many ways a dangerous idea, because it contrasts with the Enlightenment humanist ontological tradition of being as the distinction between being and not being. And that still and continues to be seen as a totality through negation. What isn't, um, the relationship between what is and isn't is the totality that's expected from the entitlement. That also gives way to a binary logic, which then prioritises human rationality over everything else. Uh, the markers nor um, gives us a little bit more. There's a limited possibility of cumulative and ordinal inclusion and exclusion. So it takes it a bit further. But I think we can even go a bit further than the norm, which is the kind of stuff I'm thinking about more, more at the moment. And um, also then seeing this as a generalisation of Maturana and Vela's, Varela's theory of autopoiesis. So... Um, I'm setting a particular focus within the remaining um, uh, part of the presentation. I'm just keeping an eye on time. Yeah. Um, I'm going to focus on a particular piece of historical sociology, which is about three slides, and then that will leave us... I, I suggest that might prompt a bit of discussion out of that, so I'm leaving a bit longer for the discussion here. So uh, I'm using uh, Nicholas Luhmann's societal forms as an evolutionary approach to societal structure and differentiation. So, broadly we're thinking in terms of a you know, segmentary side society based on family, tribe, locality, as the basis of a differentiation as marked social forms and social structure. Uh, and the dis dis differentiation uh, marked form and distinct but inseparable from society. So the fa family is both distinct but part of society. But then we're talking about a totality of society and we believe we also lead to incompleteness. That gave way then to stratification, which is towards aristocratic society as um, segmented societies uh, became increasingly unstable, new structures were found. And this accounts for much of the Middle Ages and early modernity. And what we have uh, in, in contemporary world is something called functional differentiation. I'm not going to talk about that at all. So I'm going to go back to early segmentary societies and it's, um, you know, I'm thinking in terms of an agrarian society prehistory within the stratification of antiquity and classical antiquity. So we're going to think about that in terms of laws of form and hopefully discuss that. So, one back. Uh, 20,000 years BCE, um, Ethiopia, the Shango bones, and uh, uh, there is an earlier... Uh, one of this, that's, I think about 35, 40,000 years ago, the, fir the, the first computer, I'll give you the first computer here, and uh, it's not quite clear what, what these notches are. Um, I'm just going to move this so I can read my own slides. Over there too. Um, 
Uh, it might have been for counting, in terms of counting stock. It might have been for the passage of time by counting astronomical si uh, cycles. But certainly, and this is why everything subsumes to sociology, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, is that this is something that's taking place in society as a societal need to manage the complexity of society. And we see within this uh, the use of distinctions in terms of cardinality. You know, three as... And, and going back to William Bricken's kind of uh, uh, iconic um, arithmetic, this is clearly at play here. But always... Uh, Within this, within the definition of three as these cumulative distinctions, this is in a world of indeterminacy again. There's still the ontology within this. Uh, or or there's still there's a non-ontology in this, in that we don't know what's beyond that three. But this is society, this is consciousness, this is practicality, this is technology coming together. But implicit in thinking about this as a mathematical artefact, if we can, I suppose we can... Or, or as an antecedent kind of evolutionary uh, mathematics, is to see this, um, uh, to see that inherent in this is not just a practical artefact for doing something in agrarian, family based, tribal societies, but also as a, um, it, it's also, a, a, it's, it be, it's that tool. But also it's kind of like articulating the forms and the way in which we might think about number in, a, in, an, in an emergent way. And you th think about this in terms of the way I think about it is, is what problems of prehistory does this address and what new problems does it create? And we get a series of complexities in terms of trying to represent and do things practically that create more complexity that have to be solved. So moving into then antiquity, and I've just chosen the Middle East here, um, and the way in which they were dealing with uh, number as part of society. So we have um, an authority rather than a, a more um, homogenous uh, separation of society in families and tribes. There's a centralised authority, but very much a need for a technology to manage the city-states of, of these early civilizations, and using this token system alongside an envelope, effectively, very logically and very simply, we have a series of tokens that can be put in an envelope, and you, you've got an antecedent for place value. And what I was thinking about when I was putting this together yesterday is thinking about, again, this in, in, in William Brickham's relation to the kind of iconic algebra, what's really happening here is... It, it, it matches that. We're, we're introducing an, or, uh, an ordinality in this as well by creating a pre place value. They, they did that, the, the Babylonians did that fairly quickly by doing, making this symbolic. So, well, we don't actually, you know, don't actually need to collect tokens in envelope. We can just mark this on a piece of clay. And uh, when I was a maths teacher, I always used to point out to English teachers that um, you know, mathematicians effectively invented writing. So, in, in later antiquity, um, we are getting more generalised semantic structures and some of the relations with mathematics. So, uh, mathematics is not only solving the practical requirements of those societies, um, we are also trying to there's also a point at which mathematic, mathematicians are observing their own mathematics and look at the relations within it. And this, I haven't represented in a series of uh, uh, laws of form kind of distinctions, but you can see then the distinctions within the distinction, the creations of, 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 of creation of observations within observations. And we start to see mathematics uh, differentiating from the rest of society, the system's communication of it, it within itself. But always I argue with these, and increasingly I've been looking at this, implicit in the consideration of education, uh, and how mathematical ideas, process and relations are explained and proceduralised, is a kind of view of education, in the sense of how can we practically know this? 
how can we deal with this <laughs> mentally, although at one level we're dealing with practical problems of society, sharing things out, uh, collecting taxes, um, division of, of, of uh, land, um, and in relation to collection of revenues for that city-state, but also starting to think about some of the relations in, within that, you know, some of the generalised theory, and this is predating classical anti antiquity. Um, and, and writing itself, as well as mathematics, or written mathematics, is a, is, is a feature of stabilising this stratified society that's run by uh, an aristocracy, an elite, often in those early civilizations, a single elite that's given an authority of God, or a deity, uh, as well, which is an important dimension. It's an important problem that I'm going to conclude with about for mathematics in classic antiquity. So, um, the distinction between universality and contingency uh, is a big problem in this. So, we have uh, an authority of writing, we have a mathematical authority, we have an authority, a political authority of state, um, and this is supposed to explain everything. There's supposed to be something immortal and eternal in this authority. The problem is then dealing with contingency. What's going to happen in every day? Um, in our everyday experience. And this is where kind of, you can go back to the phenomenology in terms of thinking about no matter how you contain it and make a selection, you make a mark, there's always a possibility of something being unexplained in our daily experience. And you get this distinction between transcendence and imminence that becomes a problem through antiquity and into classic antiquity, and hasn't really left us, actually, is what is permanent... What do we know for certain? What endures and what is imminent? What emerges? Or, as Durkheim characterised it, the sacred and the profane. Um, and one of the problems here then, and so I, you know, I've captured this uh, distinction in terms of the imminence, the profane, the everyday, and the transcendent as the sacred. And mathematics has to find its way in here in classical antiqu antiquity. Um, and uh, I, I've, I've done this kind of same kind of phenomenological demand. I've set up the distinction between imminence and transistence as, as a kind of as a possibility of a neg negation or nor. But actually, then, if I, I put the phenomenology in there, if I put the uh, overarching mark in there, I see that in the ontology of in imminence and transcendence is still within an unmarked state. And um, the demand then for mathematics is as a, as a closed ref, self-referential system of communication. Uh, and the aim then is to try and through classical antiquity um, is to, for a mathematics that can prove itself from itself. And in this way, I mean, the, the Pythagoreans, uh, Bernie Lewin uh, covers this really well, I think, in his, his very interesting book on enthusiastic mathematics, is wrestling with the mysticism or dealing with that because if, you, if mathematics presented some transcendence that was going to tread on the toes of existing, existing mysticism or some kind of religion could be quite fatal and often was. So the idea was then is to set this up distinct from that and that set us rolling uh, uh, into the future. And... Um, And I think from, from there, uh, what we're seeing with some of these... I'm, I'm setting up some of these distinctions in which mathematics appears as, as a, practical, uh, a practical solution to science problems that creates its own... I'm going to stop sooner than that so we can have some discussion. And um, I'm going to start after the next slide. And uh, then from then, what, you know, many ways in which uh, we've seen constructions of physics... Uh, and ideas of physics are solving problems that we created in antiquity and dream, dealing with the distinction as effectively consciousness. Um, I, and what, what I'm really doing here is moving away from the philosophy of mathematics and mathematics education as a problem of representation. And I kind of refer again back to um, the interesting stuff that Bernie Lewin's done on that in, in, in setting out the philosophical, um, uh, a philosophical narrative for what's happening with mathematics in there. And um, 
and, and, and seeing teaching and learning mathematics as a representative of the world. Of the world. And William Brickham was saying, you know, what, why can't mass education uh, take these things up, take a kind of mathematics? And there's a paper I refer to that I've attempted to, to kind of entice mathematics educators to think about laws of form and completely failed in doing that uh, because our practices of education in modernity are very much based on the practices of education rather than the knowledge we make outside of education. That's the clash, one of the clashes between research and practice. Um, so I, I, I'd argue then that mathematics and mathematics education can, can be understood in terms of the evolution of distinctions and more sophisticated sets of distinctions that collapse or reform, um, endure for a time. Uh, always this this uh, demand for mathematics to be self-contained. Godel support that completely, and, and I think Godel's very important in this in terms of uh, pointing out. I was trying to do the opposite, of course, to point out that uh, you know there was always something beyond that system of mathematics. There was always something that mathematics needed beyond itself uh, to, um, to, to uh, be a, a, a system. It was... Um, and this ambition for a closed system has proved to be a problem. And this, I think, is where the kind of thinking we've got going on around laws of form is quite useful in addressing this. And... Uh, you know, one of the things in this, then this starts to address the kind of work I'm doing that I've kind of illustrated with this historical sociology very rapidly through antiquity and classic antiquity is this distinction of cognition and sociality that has really, really uh, not been, a, pro been uh, a bit of a problem in not just in math education but in social sciences more generally. And just to finish off, there's three bits of work uh, that I've got going on. So the first one I mentioned was the, uh, which I wrote after coming to the last conference, uh, to think about, uh, really thinking about laws of form in terms of mass education, and as, as I say, a failed attempt to uh, invite mass educators to think about it. Um, and then I'm starting to think about some of the things, or, or in the next two papers, uh, the second one isn't in Portuguese, by the way. Uh, that's just the title. It's in a Portuguese uh, book. Uh, oh, uh, and and uh, the, the final one, then I'm elaborating ideas. And, and what I refer to as functional differentiated society, I'm starting to think about those things in there. So uh, that's me, Duck. So I hope we can have a bit of We have some time for some questions. We have one. Somebody in chat. There's some on the chat. So let's do a chat one and then Sahu and then Andre. Um, who should we give it to next? Andre has his hand up. Okay, how about Andre? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I love all the human references you make. And I have at first a funny observation because at the foil, what we saw, the bone with the marks in it. Uh, you denoted the number three as a combination of four marks. And it's quite fascinating. If you see the mark from George Spencer Brown, it automatically invokes in my head the law of calling and the law of uh, cancellation, the law of crossing, so that the number three would simply vanish the way you uh, denoted it. That was the first uh, observation. But my question would be, uh, you uh, describe mathematics as an autocratic system, communication system in the Luhmann style. Yeah. And one requirement uh, for defining an automatic, uh, uh, an autocratic system would be that it operates on one single code. So my question would be, in, in that view of yours, what would be the code, the basic distinction of mathematics? Valid or not valid, same as science. So, uh, okay, same, same as science, truth or... Uh, yeah, so... so but the that's why mathematics would be a discipline of science. Yes, right. I'm yes. Sure yeah, there's, there's a strong association with science. I, it's not clear to me at various times how mathematics and science relate. But um, 
Uh, the, the, of course, the distinction is in, with, with science is that you know, the method is reason, and whereas science, uh, it's, it's a- empirical and theoretical. So there's a slightly different approach, or a completely different approach, but the two relate there. So, uh, I, I mean, you could clearly say that, those, that mathematics is differentiated in modernity from science, but uh, you know, back in Aristotle's day, uh, it, it, <coughs> what, that wasn't so much clear. Um, so, uh, but the programs are similar in that there's some kind of uh, you know theoretical argument, uh, argument to try and determine what's true or false. And it's interesting. I, I, the point you make about the three is really important because that's it. You know, the the number three is a construct. It's a selection from from anything possible. And the totality of that is indeterminacy. You know, we could say it's nothing, or you know. Spencer Brown argued the void or nothing, and I don't. I think he was trying also trying to get at this kind of endlessness or eternity of the unmarked state that we can't quite, quite, whether we're physicists, sociologists, or mathematicians, we can't quite get a handle. It's just not what we're looking at. Right, and uh, we have another question right here. Uh, thank you for uh, tracing the history of the uh, number making the mark to the Shango bone and uh, and you were mentioning like that oh okay it might be to account the crops or like an uh, agricultural uh, mm. reason for it uh, but actually I, it's interesting I was reading about it uh, earlier as well and uh, it, I mean of course it's hard to know if it's true or not and, and what the marks really interpret but uh, one possible story is that it was to keep track of the menstrual cycle, yeah. really, and, and it's then there's a, a need, like a biological yeah. a, a, a need to keep record of, of uh, recurring biological yeah, yeah, rhythms, yeah. and that that the that sort of possibly encouraged us to start <coughs> counting, and that the periodicity of yeah, that. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right, and I think that you know that's why I say we're all sociologists, really, because you know this is constructed in this. You know, you were seeing this. If that's true, and I, I think there's a lot of evidence for that, we can't really know. If that's true, then family is becoming an important differentiation of society back then, and this then is the uh, a, a thing that's supporting that. So I think this is absolutely true. Or okay, possibly true. Just another minute or so. Yes, it, it struck me that you said uh, to separate the relation between mathematics and science, and I was wondering why did you not say technology? Because uh, I, I don't see technology as distinct from nature. Um, but that is a decision or a, a non-distinction that you make, but you could say a technology is an application. Technology you yeah. leads to artifacts that didn't exist before humans <coughs> created them. So um, did you not consider that the, the creation of the technology motivated the thinking of mathematics that then was mystified for the purpose of keeping it sacred? Uh, of course, I think all that's true. And sorry about the flippant remark, because I think it, it, is, it is useful to kind of deconstruct the distinction between nature and, and technology. But also, and I'd kind of like, I, this is a general, a general warning for laws of form, ontologize it at your own risk. <laughs> and uh, ontologize it at your own risk, but also ontologize it as a creative act, but be aware that you're ontologizing it. Yes. Yeah? And so uh, I think that's, I think everything you say is absolutely right. And it's useful to make that distinction, but also ask the question why are we making the distinction between technology and nature? And why doesn't technology follow its own? Technology seems to be following sim- similar evolutionary principles in nature. We could, we could say that animals are a technological innovation of the plants. <laughs> oh, we could, we could. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but sorry, I sorry just, just more just questions. One yeah. thing is the question of responsibility. If we, if we do not make the distinction, we can say, oh, we're not responsible for our actions. We, it's not even important to ask the question. And I think we... We, we need to be able to ask the question. I, I absolutely agree. And also, uh, but also, the same point is to deconstruct the humanism in here. And that's not go post-human completely, because human rationality is important. Yeah. But also, we're not as powerful as we think. No. 
Okay, I'm afraid that that's all the questions we have, we have time for. Alexander, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, is that okay? Okay. All right. Let's thank Stephen Watson. Thank you. Thank you.